by Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you everybody for joining us today to welcome back cultural practitioner and published author Lane Wilkin. He will be sharing his personal work and research regarding Batok, Batek, and Batuk. I hope y'all are excited as much as I am. Uh, but before we welcome him, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alan Bustos. I'm a current student at Skyline College, majoring in electrical engineering. I'm also an ASSC Senator and Student Ambassador for Project Change. I'm excited to learn more from a historian like Lane. Lane's work does a lot of preserving indigenous knowledge that I feel strongly connected to as a Filipino American who grew up in the States. To set our space, we have our heart our house rules our community or community agreements which are to respect the space keep an alcohol and drug free virtual space show up with a community minded attitude support and show love to our presenter and if you have any questions use our event slido if you haven't used slido before we'll take a quick look here Feel free to ask your question in the box. Your name is optional and then click send. If you like a question that is already being asked, click the thumbs up and it will be upvoted to the question queue because we only have maybe up to three to four questions tops. And one last plug on our Padlet. If you like my background, you will see the main Zoom backgrounds by Ryan Sam for you to download on our Padlet. Uh, now it's my pleasure to welcome our guest, Lane Wilkin, who is a scholar, cultural tattoo, tattoo practitioner, and advocate for the clearly endangered practice of book for cultural tattoos of the Philippines. He also has studied other related indigenous traditions of the Philippines and the greater Pacific with nearly three decades of research and experience. His mother is from the Philippines and his father is of English and Scandinavian descent. Lane is the author of Filipino Tattoos, Ancient to Modern and The Forgotten Children of Maui. He is also a contributing writer to Back from the Crocodile's Belly, Philippine Babylon Studies and the Struggle for Indigenous Memory, and Shamanic Transformations, True Stories of the Moment of Awakening, as well as several articles for various magazines and journals. So please show your love in the chat for Kuya Lane Wilkin. everyone. Good afternoon or morning, uh, depending on your time zone. And uh, thank you for having me back here again at Skyline. I, uh, I have such fond memories of visiting you folks in person. And hopefully before too long, we can do this again in person. Um, with that, uh, thank you for the introduction, Alan. And thank you to all the organizers for this uh, event. Um, I guess we'll just get right into it and let me share my screen. I'm a little bit slow with the tech, but give me a minute. Oh, wait, no. Oh, present, not share, what the hell? There you go. Loading, there, there. you go. Is there, can you folks see that? Nod your head if you can see it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alan. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, so um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and begin. Now the title of my presentation, uh, you'll see that there are three different words there. Patok, patok, patok. Depending on how you want to pronounce it, depending on how it's spelled, it's pretty much pronounced the same. Uh, and 
one of the things I want to clarify before we begin is that although we will be speaking in generalities about uh, the tattooing practices of the Philippines, um, remember that each of the, the cultures of, that have these tattoos are distinct individual cultures and it would be inappropriate for anyone to you know, screenshot something on here and tattoo it on themselves. Uh, until you know the context, until you know what ethnic group these marks belong to, uh, and it may not be appropriate for you to wear. And so please keep that in mind. Please respect uh, what we're sharing today. Uh, no biters, please, so to speak. Okay. All right. So, Patok, Marks Beyond uh, Identity. Uh, today I'm going to share some cultural aspects of tattooing from the Philippines. Now, there's been a lot of talk about these marks as marks of identity, as tribal identifiers, etc. And that's been well established. And we see that all across the Pacific. Um, these marks uh, that our ancestors put in the skin did all, a lot of uh, definition of roles and role expectations in, in their particular cultures. And a lot of people have written about identity. But I would like to discuss with you today um, some aspects of our tattooing that go beyond this. And, uh, and I'm excited to share this. This is a new presentation for me. I've only given it a couple of times. I'm still getting the hang of it. So bear with me if I stutter here and there. But let's get right into it. So today we're going to decolonize your understanding of tattoos. And to do that, we really need to decolonize our understandings of the cultures of the Pacific. And since it is Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander month, um, I'd just like to show briefly some of the correlations between that. Now, a lot of people, they ask me the question, are Filipinos Asian or Pacific Islander? Well, you know, it depends on how you look at it. If you look at it from the standpoint of geographical, modern socio-political boundaries, then we're Asian because we're regulated to Southeast Asia. That's a modern designation done by Western cartographers. Those are not indigenous boundaries. Um, now, if you were looking at our culture, for, uh, you know, our identity from a cultural standpoint, who are we, we more akin to in terms of our culture, Culturally, we're more like the Pacific Islands, but due to uh, these modern contrivances and uh, the politics that go along with that, um, people say that we're Southeast Asian. And, you know, that's, that's the reality of things. But I'm looking at things more from a cultural standpoint. What do we have in common culturally, not just with these uh, geopolitical boundaries? So here, what is the word for I in Filipino? Who, who, someone can put it in the chat. Um, but let me share with you the word for I in these different languages. Uh, you can see that in most Filipino languages, the word for I is mata. In Tahitian, it's the same. In Samoan, it's the same. In Tongan, it's the same. In Chamorro, it's the same. In Hawaiian, you just change that T to a K, maka. It's the same word. They're all cognates of the same word. Is this the only example? No. And we don't have time to really go into a huge linguistic comparison, but here's something else. The main difference between Philippine languages and what we see out further out in the Pacific is that we will close the vowel on the end of words. So you have a word like langit in the Philippines, which means sky or heavens. You go down, you remove that T and you get langi, which is the Tongan word. Uh, you also have langi in Samoan, even though it's spelled L-A-G-I, that G is pronounced ng. Uh, you have rangi in Maori, uh, ra'i in uh, Tahitian, uh, lani in Hawaiian, and you shorten it a little bit more and you just get la in uh, Marshallese. So you can see the transition as people migrated across the Pacific that the language adapt was adapted to local regions. It was shortened, it was abbreviated, altered, but we basically are all speaking daughter languages of a parent language. Um, here are the primordial parents that we see in many parts of the Pacific, as well as the Philippines. The first primordial male in the Philippines is Laki and his wife, uh, Bai or Babae. The, these are our terms for male and female in the Philippines, Lalaki. So if I refer to myself as Lalaki, 
I'm really speaking the name of that earliest ancestor or God. If I refer to you as Baba'e, that is the mother. And you can see there in Southern Maori, the, ch the name changes a little bit to Raki and Papa. Uh, Northern Maori is Rangi and Papa. Uh, Eastern Polynesia changes to Rangi Atea and Papa or Atea and Papa in the two Motus. And finally, when we arrive at Hawaii, the name changes to Wakea and his wife, Papa. So a lot of people of the Pacific were actually claiming descent from the very same parents by name. Uh, here's another example real quick. Uh, this is, uh, this god, Angalo, is found in the Philippines. He is one of our creator deities in, among the Ilocanos and also the Visayans. And then there are remnants of him in other parts as well. But if you look at the name here, in, if you look at Vanuatu and you look at their creator god, you're going to find Tagaro. And you can see that it is a very similar name to Angalo. Uh, if you look at older references where they list Vanuatu before they changed the name back to Vanuatu, it, it was referred to as New Hebrides. They will sometimes record it as Takaro. In Samoa, you have Tangaloa. In New Zealand, you have Tangaroa, uh, Tonga Tangaloa, Tahiti Ta'aroa, Tanaoa, Kanaloa, Loa, Loa Langi. This deity is found all throughout the Pacific in various forms or another under slightly different names or different sorbiquets. So uh, with that in mind, just this is a very quick, brief overview of some of the linguistic research that I've done. But you can see we're all kind of related. We all worship the same beings. We all claim descent from the same beings. We speak daughter languages of, a, of the same parent languages. And so keep, please keep that in mind while I discuss some of these designs. Some of these designs you might recognize, uh, you might not recognize. Some of the designs might look like designs in other parts of the Pacific, but it's because we come from a parent culture that had these designs. And as time went on and people migrated, uh, those designs were altered. So you might have a centipede design from the Philippines that looks identical to a centipede design in Samoa, but where it's placed on the body and the size of that design changes where it comes from. So depending on the placement, the orientation of the design, the size of the design, it denotes a particular Pacific culture. So even though you might have that in your tradition, if you expand it, like if you put that centipede design from here down to your pubic bone, now you have something from Melanesia or from Papua New Guinea. So again, until we have literacy, please don't copy anything that you see here. All right. So in an effort to uh, decolonize our understanding of tattoos, I uh, put up this, uh, this little statement here. Uh, modern tattoos are the evolutions of the appropriation of cultural skin marking traditions and stripped of their cultural context and turned into simple art. This is what modern tattooing is. And I'm, I'm sorry if I offend a few people out there, but that really is what, it, what has happened. Europeans came to our, our islands. One of the first people brought to, the, to Europe with tattooing from the Pacific was a man by the name of Gioli or Giolo. Uh, he was likely Yapese that was found in the Philippines, sold as a slave to an uh, uh, English privateer called William Dampier, who brought him to England where he died of the d European diseases. Um, they put his skin on display for a number of years until uh, it deteriorated. Um, just awful, awful thing. But you know, Westerners were enamored with our, with our body markings and, and took it upon themselves, turning it into just simple art. Tatao, cultural tattooing, reminds us that we are not fully colonized. This is a quote by my friend, Sua Suluape Aisea Toituu, who is a Tufunga Tatao, a master tattooist of the Tongan Samoan tradition. Um, and I really like this statement. Uh, when we decolonize our body, it, it is a form of resistance, even though that's not the intent of our, our sacred markings. It is a form of resistance to westernization. We have not been fully colonized when we wear our ancestors' marks. So here we have the Philippines. 
And you can see from this map, these are some of the provincial boundaries and, and borders. And with each of these borders gives you an idea of just how many different ethno-linguistic groups there are in the Philippines. And even within these provincial boundaries, there are multiple ethnic groups. We have over a hundred distinct languages in the Philippines. And with those languages and their associated dialects, you have different cultures. So although we share many, many commonalities, these cultures are unique. So again, just like with the rest of the Pacific, if you see a design from one region, you might have it in another region, but how that is placed on the body, its size and orientation determines what ethnic group it belongs to. So let's just establish this. Tattooing is a tradition from our islands in the Philippines that is literally thousands of years old. This isn't a modern fad. Uh, some of the oldest uh, artifacts in regards to tattooing found in the Philippines have been dated at nearly 4,000 years old. That's the median for the carbon dating. The, the upper end was over 4,100 years old. The lower end was 3,700 years old, but approximately 4,000 years old. And this is just what we've discovered. Um, we have hafted bone implements with combs, something that you see very uniquely in the Pacific. Hand tapping, the hand tapping technique is is almost exclusively found in Southeast Asia and the rest of the Pacific. There are a few uh, small ethnic groups up in Northern India that also practice hand tapping, and they probably are related to us as well, but much more distantly. Um, okay. So this is Apu Anno's back. Uh, I was privileged to be able to meet him. His descendants still live in the valley. Uh, they took me and my brother and a friend to go visit his sepulcher. And we were also given permission to photograph him. Um, Apo Anno is estimated to be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years old. And you can see he is covered head to toe with tattoos. Uh, this image you might be familiar with, this is from the Boxer Codex, dated at 1590. Uh, these are, this, this is an illustration of uh, Pintados or Visayan men. Uh, I don't know how many people we have in the audience today that are Visayan, but this is what your ancestors wore. And they wore body suits from head to toe. Similar to Samoa, the first tattoos that men received in the ancient Visayas started uh, on the legs only. They did the lower part of the body first before they received the remainder of their tattoos. Very similar to the Samoa, Samoan uh, malofie, or more commonly referred to as the pea. Uh, the lower, the body suit that extends from the ribs down to below the knees. Uh, this is one of the names that the Spaniards gave our islands originally. Um, Originally, they, they named it the Islands of St. Lazarus, but then they changed it to Las Islas de los, de los Pintados, or the Islands of the Painted People, because just about everyone they encountered was tattooed. Tattooing was an integral part of the culture. There was social stigma against those who had no tattoos. If you were not tattooed, you were not socially acceptable. And it even bled into our afterlife beliefs in many places where if you did not have tattoos, you would not be accepted by your ancestors in the afterlife. And so there was a very strong uh, motivation to be tattooed as part of being included or that inclusivity of the culture, you needed to be tattooed. That was one of the, the requirements for most people. There were a few exceptions, but we don't have time to talk about that just yet. So again, even though we come from the same islands, there are different cultures, uh, and please respect that. So what's the difference between regular tattoos and cultural tattoos? Well, obviously, the method of, of application is different. Uh, we use different tools. Uh, the, the modern tattoo machine is not the, same, not the same sensation as receiving it from the tools that our ancestors once used. So on the left of your screen, you'll see a few examples of some of the tools I most commonly work with. Uh, the, the one on the far left is a, is a reconstruction, a modern hafting 
using a Samoan method, which was taught to me by my mentors and teachers. Um, the one in the middle on the left side of the screen, that's called a Kikisi. Uh, that's found from the province of Abra. And then the, the last one on the left side of the screen is called a Gisi or a Kisi. And that is from uh, the Kalinga region of the Philippines. And it's made out of a bent carabao horn. The one on the right is called the Igihisi. This is from the Apayao region of the Philippines. And it is one of the most unique tattooing implements I've ever uh, had the privilege of working with. It is a hand tap tool. Uh, it, is, uh, it provides its own fulcrum. It provides its own spring. With these other tools, I'm using my hand to provide the spring for that. This is a, even though it's technologically simple, it is a very sophisticated tool. And uh, I've been working with it more often lately. And if you would like to see a little video, here we go. Let's see. I'm going to show you a little video of that tool in action. My sister was singing through her pain a little bit there. <laughs> But it's a genius tool. It's, it's, when, I make, when I reconstruct these tools, I'm just entranced by the genius of our ancestors that even though something's technologically simple by our standards does not mean it's not sophisticated. Our people have been tattooing for literally thousands of years and it would be arrogant for us to think that we know better than they do. This is a, this is a art form or practice that has been explored for over all those millennia, we've worked the ins and outs. We know its reaction uh, to the body, how it plays out that way. So uh, I like to use the, the old tools. Uh, I don't actually know how to tattoo with a modern tattoo machine. Um, my teachers encouraged me never to learn that because they described it as seductive um, and too easy, I guess. <laughs> but uh, these tools that our ancestors used, uh, when you experience the kisi uh, and penetrating your skin, you are experiencing what your ancestors felt. In the words of one of my teachers, uh, Sua Suluape uh, Kione Nunes, he says, there are not many things that you can do in this life where you can have the same experiences that your ancestors had hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. This is something very visceral. And a lot of people, when they receive their markings this way, they'll remark to me that the, that the tapping feels soothing, that it feels familiar. And, and that's because this is what our people experienced before. Uh, whoops. So here's one of the main differences between Western tattooing and our cultural tattoos is that in Western tattooing, it's all about individuality. It's all about you, really. It's about what you want to express about yourself, your, your, ident your own definitions of identity versus your community definitions of identity and inclusion. So in Western ta tattooing, it, these are marks of exclusion, whereas cultural tattooing are marks of inclusion. Your ancestors' wisdom created these designs. They chose the meanings. They decide the location on your body. And in contrast, you have Western tattooing, where you decide what designs you want, you decide what the meaning is for those designs, and you decide the location on your body. Um, you can go into a tattoo shop, you can look on the wall, and, oh, I like that flash of that rose, and, my grandmother's name is Rosita, so I want to put that over my heart because I want her to be close to me always. And that's a wonderful reason to get tattooed. But you are setting the meaning for that. You have chosen the design yourself. You've chosen the location on your body. Another person can go in there and see that same exact tattoo, say, I want that on my hand. I want that rose on my hand because I'm a botanist and my favorite plant is, is ro are roses. So again, you're choosing the design, the meaning, and the location on your body. Whereas in cultural tattooing, all that is chosen for you, and it has been for thousands of years. 
Many of the designs are stylized representations of our ancestors or anito in their animal forms. This term anito is found also in many parts of the Pacific. In uh, Chamorro, you say aniti, you just put substitute, substitute the O for an I. Uh, or in Samoan, you drop the N and just say aitu or aitu. Um, but many of these uh, designs that we have in our tattooing are these stylized representations of ancestors in their animal forms. And this is one of the big ones, uh, literally big ones, that we have tattooed on our bodies. Uh, this is a, the crocodile, obviously. And for many peoples of the Philippines, this is one of those animal forms. I, among ancient Tagalogs, for example, as well as other ethno, ethno linguistic groups, this, was, this animal is referred to as Nuno or Nono or Ninuno. Uh, this, uh, this term actually means ancestor. And uh, crocodiles were addressed as such. If uh, a dead crocodile was found on, on the beach or on the bank of a river, it was given full burial rites because you were honoring the ancestor that this animal represents. Um, and so this animal's found in our tattooing. So here's an example. This is from Bontok. This is a Pinangar uh, tattoo on the jawline uh, on this young man. Uh, it represents the crocodile teeth along his jaw to show his personal ferocity and power. Um, sometimes the representations of crocodiles are in their submerged state. So most of the time when you see your crocodile, you don't really see the animal. You see it swimming through the water and you might see those ridges along its back. Um, the implication there is that the ancestor is present but not seen, just like the crocodile. And in the old days, if you encountered a crocodile, your responsibility was to address it as if it was your ancestor. Uh, grandmother, grandfather, what is it you want me to know? And then the descendant's responsibility was to still their heart, still their mind, and allow inspiration to come through. Uh, that might be, don't go to the other village, there's enemy warriors up ahead. Or maybe it's, go home, you left the stove on. So you go home, you turn off the stove, and oh, thank God I came back, I listened to that intuitive voice. Otherwise, I could have burned my house down. And we, we sometimes talk about these things in vague generalities, you know, what does your gut say, things like that. But that intuitive voice, in the old days is considered the voice of the ancestors, that they speak through that very subtle form of communication, through the intuition. And that's why it was important to still your heart and mind so that you could receive that subtle form of communication. Don't go there, stay here, go, go down this route instead. And so people will come to me and say, hey, Lane, I, I heard that these designs represent protection. Can I, get, can I get the designs? And I have to tell them, you know, these are not going to stop a bullet. What protects you is that spiritual communication that these designs represent. Um, having crocodile designs like the ones on my wrist here, um, these crocodile designs are a substitute for the actual omen event. So there is no need for an actual crocodile to appear in my path for me to address as my ancestor. I always have the ancestors before me in the form of my bato, of my tattoos. And so this is one of the modern designs that I have done that incorporate those crocodile motifs as well. And this, uh, this lovely sister, we've had an opportunity to work with several times, and she's actually from Kentucky. Uh, Filipinos were everywhere. <laughs> I went to Germany and, went, and was surprised to find Filipinos there. But, uh, Cultural tattoos are applied as a ritual practice, and this is something that we see all throughout the Pacific. Uh, this isn't something that people go into lightly. This isn't just a simple transactional thing because you want to decorate your body. This is a ritual practice. There are prayers that begin with this. There are, uh, there's feasting that is, that is included in this practice. Um, it's not something that is taken lightly. Uh, cultural tattoos are also a form of medicine, and uh, there's spiritual aspects to it, emotional aspects to it, there are physical aspects to this, this practice. Uh, 
in Western culture, we tend to compartmentalize these different aspects of, of medicine. You know, you might go to a psychiatrist for your emotional well-being. You might go to a pastor or priest for your spiritual well-being. You go to a doctor for your physical well-being. But in the old days, all these things were looked at holistically. And, and so if you broke your leg, for example, and you went to the bone setter in your village, they would not just set the bone, but they might ask you, so how's your relationship at home with your, with your spouse? Uh, how's your relationship with your parents or your children or your community? Um, have you, have you uh, done anything lately where you might have intruded on a, on, a, on a spirit and offended the spirit? They address all these aspects in the act of setting the bone because it's all those things that might have contributed to that situation where you were not mindful, tripped over something, fell down a, a hill and broke your leg. And so they want to address all those things in our types of traditional medicine. And we see that throughout the whole of the Pacific. Um, so we're going to, even though we're going to break these down today into spiritual, emotional, and physical aspects, I want you to keep in mind that all these are considered part of one whole. So uh, let's continue. So spiritual medicine. A lot of people don't realize that, that our tattooing is used as a type of medicine. Cultural tattooing is a form of tra transformation of the person. Uh, and when you go into a tattoo ceremony, you, when you leave that, when you exit that ceremony, you are not considered the same person anymore. Sometimes in the old days, you would even change your name uh, after you received the book because you had become this different person or, your, or you, you would have received this enhancement to your person and so you would take on a name to describe that, that newness of yourself. We don't necessarily do that today anymore, but uh, cultural tattooing does transform a person. And this also, what, when you transform the body, you also transform the soul. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, many uh, ethnic groups in the Philippines, as well as further out in the Pacific, these, these markings are used for recognition by the ancestors. But in other places, anywhere from Borneo to the Philippines and further out in the Pacific, it is thought that these markings, everything that is black in the design turns into light when we die. That these markings are also upon the soul, not just on the body. And that, the illu and that when we pass off, pass on into the other life, uh, they turn into light. Um, in the southern Philippines, in Mindanao, in, with some of the ethno-linguistic groups down there, the Manubu peoples down there, they refer to it as the Gimapudsa. Um, come on, brain, you can do it. <laughs> they refer to it as Gimapud, the, the light of the soul. And... Uh, because it does illuminate after you die on the soul. So these are also markings upon the spirit, not just the body. Here's a, an example from the Kalinga region of the Philippines. And these are facial tattoos for women. They're called Ling Lingao. And the Ling Lingao are used to transform the person so that they are not recognized by malevolent entities. These are protective tattoos they change the person fundamentally so that malevolent entities cannot pursue them, to protect them. Um, Ling Ling Ao actually means to confuse. It disguises the wearer from these malevolent entities that are called Ayan. Uh, in other places, uh, Ayan or Alan would be another cognate of it. They can refer to water spirits or even ancestral spirits that are upset. And so this protects the recipient. These are predominantly found on women in the Kalinga region. So this is an, just one example of the spiritual transformation of a person when they receive a uh, emotional medicine. So uh, how, how does this work? So my, I have a few family members that have been through warfare and they have PTSD. I have a brother that's a firefighter that's been through tremendous amounts of PTSD. Uh, how was PTSD addressed in the past? Well, this is one form of addressing PTSD. This is also found, the, this type of arrangement on the body 
the sweeping up lines from the pectoral muscles over the shoulders and down the arms. Generally speaking in the Cordillera, there is a term for this called a chatlag or a chatrag or a biking or binibiking. Uh, these are different terms for the same design. And it's used to address the PTSD that comes with taking human life. Uh, most headhunting has stopped in the Philippines. This is also the mark of a headhunter in the past. And since most peoples do not headhunt anymore, uh, this tattoo has, uh, has been fading from memory uh, to some degree. And the meaning behind it has been fading. Um, here we have two more examples of Jatrag. Um, and you can see they're very ornate, they're very beautiful. And again, this was a mark of the headhunter. Little side note, um, most people don't realize that nearly all people in the Philippines headhunted at one time or another. It wasn't just regulated to the Cordillera among the people we sometimes refer to as uh, they, these mark, This practice of headhunting was found throughout the Philippines. Uh, ancient Cebuanos headhunted. The, the Spaniards recorded in their old uh, correspondences with Spain how they woke up in their forts and found all the heads missing off of people, stuff like that. Um, headhunting was practiced in Borneo. Headhunting was practiced further out in the Pacific. King Kamehameha practiced headhunting. Uh, there's a heiau, uh, the remnants of an old heiau, just right side, outside of Kai, Kaimuki near Waikiki, where he placed several heads around the heiau. Uh, the Samoans used to tattoo identifying marks on the body so that when their heads were taken, they could still identify the body. This is something that is very old. And Europeans, of course, were, were horrified by the practice. They thought, you know, oh, these, these savage people taking each other's heads. It's okay for us to blow people up with a cannon, but, you know, headhunting is savagery. Uh, most people just don't understand the practice of headhunting. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, so, the, the chatlag or chatrag is a symbol of the headhunter, but was also a, a mnemonic device referring to oral tradition. And it also addressed the PTSD of taking human life. So we're going to talk about this as a mnemonic device briefly and the oral tradition that goes along with headhunting. And this is specifically from the Cordillera. Sorry, I'm hitting it hard and fast, guys, to get all this information out there. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of time at the end for questions. So this, this practice goes back to the story of someone you may not be familiar with, but you're familiar with his brother, the story of Balitok. Balitok was, um, is a cultural hero found up in the Cordillera, specifically among the Ifugao people, but he's often referred to as the brother of Lumawig. Uh, you may not recognize who Lumawig is unless you've read my book, Forgotten Children of Maui. But again, like I mentioned in the beginning, if you just drop the G off of that name, Lumawig, you get Lumawi or in Polynesian, Maui. Um, and I'm bringing that up for you to remember later. Remember that Balitok is the brother of Maui or Lumawi. So the story goes that one day Balitok is hanging out in the village and he's being lazy, he's just laying around. And the women of the village came up to him and said, oh, Balitok, you lazy. Why are you just hanging out here? You know, go do something. And, and Balitok said, okay, um, I guess I'll go headhunting. <laughs> so... He collects a war party together, and they travel many days through the mountains until they reach the enemy territory, and they encounter a warrior named Tinig, or Montinig. And so Balitok and Tinig, they tra trade curses, and uh, then they throw spears. And Montinig is hit with many spears, and he falls to the earth. And so Balitok sweep, swoops down, he takes out, takes out his his bolo, and he chops off his head, grabs the head by the hair, holds it up to do the victory shout, but to his shock, Montinig shouts with him in victory. Now, obviously, this is not a normal thing. This is something supernatural. It frightens Balito. And so he takes Tinig's head and he buries it in the earth, and they flee back to their village. Well, 
two years pass by and Balitok is sitting in the village and he's wondering, oh, I wonder whatever happened to the head. Uh, I wonder if it's still alive. And so he makes the journey back down through the mountains to the enemy village where he had buried the head and he finds that a large tree has grown up from the grave of, uh, of Tinig's head. And uh, let me go here. I'm a, I'm a little behind my slides there, guys. He finds that a large tree has grown up, a coconut tree. In other places, like in the Kalinga region, uh, this warrior who takes many spears for his village, he transforms into a tree fern, similar looking plant. And then Balito, he, he climbs up the tree. He picks one of the fruits, he husks it, and he finds the face of Tinig. So every time you look at a coconut, you're going to see Tinig's face with those three dots on the end of it. And, you know, for, for most of us, this is just a fun little story of how the coconut came to be. The same story is found in Samoa. Uh, in, that, in that variation of the story, we learn why the women of the village wanted Balitok to go tattoo, go uh, headhunting or go do something. So in the, in the, in the, sto the Samoan story, it revolves around a woman named Sina. So in the story, depending on the variation that you read, uh, Sina is the daughter, the wife, the sister, the close rela female relation to Maui. And she goes down to a pool of water to bathe one day, or in some stories, to collect water. And while she's in this pool of water, she sees this monstrous eel. And she is frightened by the eel, so she climbs up onto the bank of the pool and to her shock and surprise, the eel, this giant eel, wiggles out of the water up onto the bank and then transforms into a very handsome young man, not named Tinig, but a similar name, Tuna. Again, drop the G, Tini Tuna. Very similar name. And Tuna says to her, oh, don't be frightened. Don't be afraid of me. Come, get into the water with me. I won't hurt you. And entices the maiden to get into the water with him. Uh, in the Samoan story, uh, it literally translates out as, then Tuna pierced her with his tail. This is obviously a euphemism. Please don't make me explain this uh, <laughs> adult euphemism to you. But long story short, uh, the maiden is violated. And she go flees back to her village and weeps. And this, of course, enrages the people of the village, specifically Maui, her relative, who hunts down the eel man uh, and beheads him, just like in the story from the Philippines. He, they take the head back to the, to the home and they bury it in the yard uh, where Sina weeps over the grave, which is very odd from our Western standpoint that she is weeping over the grave of her enemy or the man who had, had uh, violated and harmed her. Uh, but because she wept over the grave, a coconut tree grows up from the grave, just like in the story from the Philippines. And again, when the, when the fruits are husked, they see this, the same thing, the face of tuna. Now, how does this all apply in the, in the practice of head hunting? Well, in the bon, Bontok region of the Cordillera, their, their, their head hunting practice mirrors this story very closely. So headhunting is ritual warfare. Even in an open battle, once a few people, usually two or three people, had lost their lives and the putol was taken, the, the head or the hands were taken, uh, the winning side told the lo losing side, hey, you guys have had enough. Please go home. Our anger is abated. We, we have no more quarrel with you. The balance has been restored. Headhunting was more about restoring balance between communities rather than just brutality. Um, and in contrast, in modern warfare, it, we wait for the losing side to ask for surrender. It, there is no benevolence there. There is no compassion there. We will bomb you until you say we surrender. Uh, again, in contrast, in ritual warfare, the winning side determines when the losing side has had enough and the balance has been restored. Because in the old days, there was community responsibility 
rather than individual responsibility. You, of course, you had your responsibility personally, but that was in the context of the community. So if one person from another village said, let's say, murdered someone from the other village, the whole community is held responsible. Someone from that community is going to be taken in retaliation. They're not looking for the specific perpetrator, they hold the community responsible. And so that's just another little side note about the difference between the way we think nowadays as individualistic people, um, and that's a very Western way of, of being, is thinking individualistically rather than communally. So just a little more context of headhunting. So in the Bontok tradition, once, a he once the heads were taken, they would be brought back to the village where they would hold a uh, kanyao. And that's a general term. Some places they call it pidot. Um, but the kanyao is held to celebrate not only the returning warriors, but also the person who had lost their life, whose head had been taken. In parts of Kalinga, they will create little uh, bamboo baskets on top of poles and line that with red hibiscus and put the head inside of there as a, as a place of honor. And they, again, celebrate not just the warriors, but the person who had lost their lives so that they feel friendly to the village, so that the soul of that person feels friendly to the village. In other places, they actually perform rituals to adopt that person as a guardian of their village. It's a very, very different paradigm towards warfare than our modern warfare, where we just hate those people, uh, or we're taught to hate those people. This was, again, uh, a way of addressing the PTSD of the warrior to help him navigate that space. So how did this work after the Kanyao? So after the Kanyao, the heads would be taken and they would be buried for two years, just like in the story of Palito. At the end of the two year period, the women of the village take the skulls and they perform their own rituals with them. And then the skulls are placed in a in a in a, a location of honor for that spirit uh, this is when after this two-year period this is when the men received their job this is when the coconut tree grows up on their chest so if the if the torso is the trunk of the body it is, becomes the trunk of the tree and you can see that these are very stylized representations of palm or tree fern fronds that radiate from the pectoral muscles up over the shoulders. And you can see that in, in these photographs of these two uh, Mingor or warriors. Um, so physical medicine, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, most people don't realize that there was also a, fit, uh, a physical aspect to tattooing for a person's health, physically. Batok affected your bodies in a way that's beyond the aesthetic. It appears that our ancient ones understood the meridian lines of the body, uh, similar to what you see in Chinese medicine. So over here on the left side of your screen, this is a chart of Chinese medicine, uh, meridian lines in the body, and the acupuncture points that are associated with this. Now, um, I'm not, if you haven't had acupuncture before, um, and you don't know the principles behind it, basically, these access points in the body uh, affect different organ systems from a Chinese understanding. And I, that's what I'm rehearsing today. Uh, so basically in Chinese medicine, I can find one of these acupuncture points on your body and affect a particular organ system, gallbladder, stomach, uh, kidneys, whatever, um, even uh, reproductive health issues. But the acupuncturist inserts a needle, which is metal, which is electromagnetically conductive into that point and then stimulates that point with the electromagnetic field of their own body. And the human body produces all these different EM fields. Uh, your brain actually produces enough electricity to literally light up a light bulb. Your heart produces an even bigger EM field. Uh, every cell in your body uh, interacts with this, not just your nerves. And so um, just trying to very briefly, quickly establish that, yeah, there is something to qi or ki, or you know, some people might be familiar with reiki. There is something to these practices that we in Western 
cultures tend to be dismissive of. But it appears that anciently we understood this. Now, take a look at this. Here's that image from the Boxer Codex, again, dated 1590, and then side by side with the meridian lines on the body. You can see that they follow a lot of these same lines. So I discovered this a, a number of years ago, my apprentices and I, um, and I was, I, I mean, I had this mind blown moment. Holy crap, there's something here more than the aesthetic, more than the symbolism, more than the spiritualism. There's something deeper here. And so all, all these patterns seem to either run a, alongside of or on top of these meridian lines or intersect with these different acupuncture points. This in effect becomes permanent acupuncture. Now, what happens if I put a black dot over an acupuncture point? Well, in regular acupuncturist, at regular acupuncture, the acupuncturist is stimulating that point with the electromagnetic field of their own body. But if I put a black dot over that point, it's kind of like when you wear black clothing and you go out in the sun. It's hotter than wearing white clothing, for example, because the black color absorbs electromagnetic energy from the sun. We feel that expressed as heat, but we're actually absorbing different spectrums or, or different wavelengths of light included in that, not just the heat. And so it permanently stimulates this acupuncture point. My apprentices and I have put this to the test multiple times, not as any part of formal research, but uh, in, a, in, the, in the context of cultural practice. So a number of years ago, I had a, a woman from uh, Vancouver ask me about fertility tattoos. This was a 41-year-old woman, already considered a high-risk pregnancy. Uh, she her body was already acting premenopausal. Uh, menstruation was hit and miss. When she did menstruate, it was very painful. Um, she, uh, if she did conceive, she would miscarry. And she desperately wanted to have a baby with her partner before she was un completely unable to. And so she wanted to explore a holistic route and asked me for fertility tattoos. So we did some of the fertility placements on the body. This included, um, if you look on the, this picture in the center here, you'll see on his lower abdomen, uh, two little sun-like designs. And we put those, those actually intersect with, and you can see them on the left here, other, uh, right there, you see uh, um, on the left side of your screen, and does my cursor show up? Right here. This is what you're, this is kind of the same marking. So we tattooed these fertility placements on this sister, as well as some on her legs. And two months later, she called me up and she said, Lane, I'm pregnant. That child is a few years old now. Uh, in the Philippine community, we are very good at uh, sharing information. We like to network, we like to gossip, uh, chismis. And before long, many people began asking me for fertility tattoos. It kind of spread. And for probably a year or so, I was giving out fertility tattoos like they were on the clearance rack. We had multiple women asking me uh, for, for fertility tattoos, everything from painful menstruation to uh, being able to, to conceive. And we have seen consistent improvement with, with women's health just in placing some of these fertility marks on their body. And, uh, and so, um, please, please don't take, um, take this practice lightly. There's so much more depth to this than we even realized just a few years ago. Uh, here's an, another example, uh, meridian lines on, on the face. This is Natalie Portman. And then we have an Inuit uh, woman from circa 1900 uh, with, with tattoos on her face. And you can see on the chin tattoo there is the beginning of the conception vessel of the body. And it, it is marked. You also see that with Maori women, the conception vessel, the beginning of the conception vessel is marked. This is a woman from, from Brazil, uh, one of the native peoples down there. Again, the conception vessel is marked. And we consistently see this with many Native American groups in uh, that they do uh, what 
they sometimes refer to as the 111, the three lines on the chin. And you see that with uh, like the Pomo women up where you folks are from up in the Bay Area, they also had the chin stripes. This is the beginning of the conception vessel. Most of the time we see that on women, not necessarily men. <coughs> um, although there are facial tattoos in the Philippines, uh, they're set up a little bit differently. But again, we're hitting some of these major meridian and acupuncture points on the body. Uh, here's an example of um, medicinal tattooing that uh, is found up in the Kalinga region on the neck. On, these are medicinal marks on her neck to address goiter. And uh, again, it's, the idea is to add energy to that point so that the body can heal itself. Uh, this is another example, that little ring right here on the man's neck, that is also addressing a particular ailment. That was done by Apo Hong Od, our eldest practitioner in the Northern Philippines. Uh, this, is, this is an example of uh, medicinal tattoos that I've done. Um, I had a man from Toronto approach me a few years ago. He had been in a car accident, had chronic back pain, uh, was on several, several pharmaceuticals to address that back pain and had also been going to an acupuncturist. And he said that when he went to the acupuncturist, he got relief for a limited amount of time. So I confirmed with the acupuncturist what specific points they were, were using on his body. I had another acupuncturist confirm the, the location on his body. And then we tattooed these small marks on his back. This brother had a permanent three-point reduction in his pain. Here's another example. Uh, this young woman had been through some serious uh, sexual trauma. Um, her body did not produce estrogen on its own. She had to be medically induced to menstruate throughout her entire, entire um, teen and adult life. Uh, she, she asked me uh, for Bakok. We decided on doing this, uh, this, this portion of the Visayan bodysuit on her that goes over a good portion of the conception vessel of the body. Um, she was able to menstruate on her own for the first time in her life. Her body produced estrogen on its own. And that's a very important hormone for bone density as well as reproductive health. Both men and women need it. But uh, she was able to produce estrogen and menstruate on her own for the first time in her life. So again, please don't take this lightly. The most destructive aspect of colonization is discounting our ancestors' wisdom. The Philippines, <laughs> back home, certain, certain segments of our society are celebrating the Spanish advent. Uh, it's been 500 years uh, this April since the Spaniards came to our islands. And the cultural erasure that has happened, the belittling of our culture, the, the way that we as modern Filipinos sometimes view our ancestors' practices as primitive or, or as savagery, that is the brainwashing of colonization. Uh, we've been colonized twice as long in as many parts of the Pacific. And that's one of the reasons that we may not necessarily recognize Filipino culture as Pacific Islander culture, because there is this heavy Spanish veneer, uh, Chinese veneer uh, that has obscured our practices. And again, we've been colonized twice as long as other people in the Pacific. So a lot of that is much more obscured. But again, the most destructive aspect of colonization is that we discount our ancestors' wisdom, their technology, their power and one last quick example if you've driven a car ridden in a car um, worked on a car benefited from a car thank a filipino we invented internal combustion in, in the form of our uh, fire pistons that we use to start fires with it's a small bamboo tube with a piston that fits in it you put tinder in the bottom of it you pop it like that the compression ignites the tinder and Europeans took that technology, went back to Europe, developed it into the internal combustion engine. Uh, our ancestors are wise. And, and until we consider ourselves fools to their practice, we're going to look at any time that you do research 
or look into our, the history of our people, if you come from that condescending Eurocentric uh, view of our culture, you're not gonna see the genius of our ancestors. My admonition to you folks today, as always, as in my previous lectures at Skyline, is to search for your ancestors and let them find you. Because when you search for your ancestors, that's when they are able to teach you. When you put yourself in that humble position of wanting to learn, you'll be guided into the directions you need to be. You'll be guided into the most productive paths. And it may not be tattooing that resonates with you. It might be dance. It might be other forms of material culture. It might be weaving. It could be anything. It could be bark cloth making. But whatever aspect of our ancient ones practices appeals to you, you know, resonates with you, I invite you to search it out and then feel their presence around you. If you'd like to connect with me, uh, you can visit me on my website. I'm sometimes active on Insta or you can uh, uh, shameless plug for my books here. But this is a, a way for us to educate beyond uh, one hour uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, so thank you so much for, for having me back at Skyline. I hope that this presentation has been uplifting and enriching and expands your understanding of the richness that we, we have as people of the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Kui Lane. Let's show some love for him in the chat. So I think we're gonna do some Q&A. Do we have time for that still, Alan? Yes, we're gonna, I'm gathering some questions right now from the Slido. Again, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Happy to do so. Uh, first question, can you explain more on what the conception vessel is? Okay, so the conception vessel is a see? large meridian line that extends from the bottom of the lip, and this is according to Chinese medicine, from the bottom of the lip all the way down to the perineum. Uh, that is considered the energetic, uh, where the, most of the energy for uh, reproductive health is located or, or travels through. And so by accessing those points, uh, you'll uh, either add or release energy from that organ system. Um, Chinese medicine isn't something that you can, that, I mean, I've given a very brief overview, but there's a lot more depth to that. Than, than what we're able to cover today. I um, hope that clarifies things a little bit. So again, when we tattoo the conception vessel, we are creating black, we're putting black pigment into the skin, macrophages surround that black ink, isolate it and hold it in that location. Uh, and then when sunlight or any form of light hits that black area, it absorbs that energy and the, the organ system benefits from it. Um, next question is, which books or other resources would you recommend in order to begin into culture um, or tattoo culture and general culture? So one of the reasons I compiled my books is that uh, it's because most of this information is found in fragments. Uh, throughout uh, different manuscripts and different books. Uh, there, it's very hard to just find a book that encompasses everything. Uh, but this is a good foundational book uh, for you. If you can get your hands on it, there, it's also available as a PDF online. Um, this is uh, William Henry Scott's Barangay. And this is uh, about the 16th century Philippines. It's very science-centric although it does uh, tackle parts of Luzon, the Tagalog, the Kapapangan people, the, uh, the Pangasinanse to a small degree, uh, but it gives you a very, uh, a, a very holistic view of uh, 16th century Philippine culture. Um, and because all these cultures in the Philippines are related, 
it kind of helps you have a model to see what might be in other regions. But uh, it is very Visayan centric, but again, um, you can draw a lot of correlations with that. A lot of a lot of the practices that you see in the Visayas, like the, you know, everything from the tattooing to the the different roles in in society are also found in other parts of the Philippines too. The different social classes are also found uh, throughout the Philippines as well as the Pacific. So, like for example, in the Philippines, we use the term datu to mean chief, uh, someone who's in charge of labor in Samoa could be referred to as Latu, just change that D to an L. In Fiji, they still refer to the governor as Ratu. Uh, in Hawaiian, uh, you might refer to a chief as a fu'u haku. This is another cognate of this word. Um, in, uh, I think, uh, Mangareva, they say atu uh, to mean lord or somebody who is uh, a master over something else. So you, Again, even if you're not Filipino and you read this book, you're gonna see a lot of correlations between our cultures. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But this is a good resource to start, start you out is, is this book, uh, Barangay. You can see I got it heavily marked. <laughs> that, that coffee is pretty old. Uh, we have another question and it's asking, how, how can we separate out tattooists who are historically, culturally accurate or responsible with these traditional designs that's a that's a hard that's a hard task i would say uh because and this is the this is a problem that i i encounter all the time uh i'll have people that there people want to call them out say hey you're not doing this accurately hey you're not you're not doing this right and then there's the question of who who has the authority to call out people. You know, I uh, I myself have been called out by a number of academics uh, who just seem to have a personal vendetta against me. Uh, but they're they're accusing me of uh, tattooing kalinga things on people. But because that that's because there is no literacy right now. So one of the problems that we have is when. Uh, if you're familiar with Apo Huang Pod, our eldest practitioner in the Philippines, she's over a hundred years old. And people began visiting her in her remote village in Buscalan up in the mountains to get tattoos from her. Then the, she had the media blow her up. And so people began going up there, treating her like a regular tattoo shop. People have even gone so far as to create tattoo flash for her, uh, taking designs out of my book, uh, off the internet and putting them on pieces of plywood that they've labeled as Kalinga tattoos. Some of the designs that have come out of my book where I am comparing and contrasting different similar markings between like, for example, Samoans. Samoan, the, the Malu design on the back of the knee, we have variations of that also in the Philippines. And I was illustrating that in my book and then uh, people put those on her little plywood, on the plywood flash that they created. And so there are people leaving Buscalan with Samoan tattoos, Samoan motifs, Ilocano motifs, etc. And so me as a cultural practitioner, I try to tattoo only the things that that person has lineage from. I don't, I'm not going to put Kalinga tattoos on someone who's from uh, Pampanga, for example. Uh, but because they're, they're, they created this flash and people are demanding that they have this tattoo on this part of my body and not treating Huang Od as the cultural practitioner and expert she is, people will you know, come out of the mountain and say, oh, I got this Kalinga tattoo, but it's actually Ilocano or it's actually Samoan. Um, and so I've had these academics, they see this and they'll say, hey, why are you uh, tattooing Kalinga designs on people? Uh, and I have to tell them, you know what, here's, here's the truth of the matter, is you're not literate in these designs. You can't differentiate what is Kalinga and what is not. You can't differentiate what is Ilocano and what is Kapapangan, for example, or Tagalog, or even Visayan. Uh, they called out this poor uh, young woman who's an artist who had been doing these really cute um, uh, cartoon figures of uh, some of the deities from the Philippines, and she put tattoos on them. And they called her out, oh, you're appropriating Kalinga culture, you're appropriating Igorot culture. And they didn't even know that 
even though the tattoos that she put on them were wrong, they were not even Kalinga, they were actually Ilocano and Visayan. Uh, so this is the problem we have, is a lack of literacy. Uh, in the past, if you saw a person walking down the path uh, in the forest, you could identify what's their rank, what's their role in, society, in, in the community. Do they belong to a friendly village or an enemy village? You could basically read what that person was about by their markings. We don't have that literacy anymore. And the problem is that tattoo artists don't have that literacy either. And so they are copying things that are copied from copies. And um, I see it all the time. Or, or someone will slap a Filipino, you know, the flag design, the sun and the three stars. They'll put that over uh, mostly Samoan designs and say, oh, it's Filipino now because I got the Filipino sun on there. That's a problem. Just because you might have a Filipino element in your composition from a tattoo artist doesn't mean that those designs are Filipino. Those designs could be Samoan, they could be Maori, they could be, they could be from Indonesia, they could be from Borneo among our cousins over there. That's the biggest problem. That's why I write the books. That's why I do these lectures is to hopefully bring more literacy to our people. We have to understand we're ignorant to, the, to these practices. We have to have the humility to understand that we are ignorant. And until we call someone out, if, if we're gonna call people out and participate in cancel culture, which I personally think is very toxic, um, I think that we should educate ourselves first. And so I think that's really, again, the, impetua, the, the motivation of all of this is, is to help everyone gain, or at least have the motivation to gain literacy again in our designs. Ilocano designs have correlations with uh, the designs that are found in uh, the Visayas, for example, but they're not the same. Uh, you can have uh, Kapapangan designs, Tagalog designs that are very similar. They used to be united under this, the same kingdom. Uh, that explains one of the reasons why their designs are so similar. But until you know those subtle nuances, you won't be able to differentiate one from the other. Um, again, education is key. I think you may have touched on um, uh, addressing this fourth question, but um, how do we address non-cultural tattooists who inappropriately use cultural tattoos? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a, uh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Uh, yeah, um, I I tried to police people when I was first doing this. Even before I was tattooing, I was trying to you know educate others. And most of the time, I'm going to these uh, non-cultural practitioners, and some of them are even from our islands. Uh, they're just tattoo artists. And at the end of the day, a tattoo artist is an artist. They're not, they're not, uh, their practice or their, their work is about them, how to differentiate themselves from an, another artist. They, they, oh, I got this style, or I do it this way, I do it that way. Uh, oh, and, and brand recognition is everything to them. Um, so when people, oh yeah, I got this from so-and-so, and uh, oh yeah, I want work from so and so, and then you know people bond over that. People do that with with my work as well, but I'm not trying to replicate or or differentiate myself by creating a style of tattooing using these marks. I'm trying to replicate what was in the past. Uh, again, I don't want to be so arrogant as to uh, so modify something outside of its normal scope, because I'm trying to trying to defer to the wisdom of those who did this in the past, not make this my own. Ideally, there would be multiple, multiple practitioners that do this work, one for each ethnic group, ideally, or, or multiples for different ethnic groups. Uh, it's kind of a heavy burden for me to bear, and it's a lot more education that, to, to try and have all these designs for all these different peoples. I mean, try and it, it, it would be if, you know, comparing it to being an expert on all the Polynesian dances, you know, that's a tall order. Uh, being an expert of all the Micronesian dances on top of it, it's a tall order. We, again, we have 
over a hundred distinct ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines. And, um, and so, you know, you might see something. I, I know there's a, one particular uh, tattoo, uh, tattoo shop that does a lot of uh, neo-tribal tattooing that they brand as traditional. I can go through any of their compositions and pick out where, which ethnic groups they belong to. Sometimes there's Samoan motifs in there. Sometimes there's Hawaiian designs in there. Uh, people, have try, people want to call them out. People want to call other people out. But at the end of the day, they're just doing art. There's no, it's not ritual. There's no prayers or offerings to the ancestors. Uh, there's no feasting that goes along with that. Uh, it's done in the context of a tattoo shop. Um, it, it's a hard thing to police, and I don't have the energy to do it, honestly. Um, I've tried. It's, it's so rampant that the most proactive thing I, I think I can do is to educate people. Um, I got some questions here I want to address, actually, if we have the time, Alan. Is that all right? Uh, someone wrote, you want us all to become headhunters? Um, no, I don't. Um, I don't necessarily want everyone to become headhunters. Most people think that the only context of our, our tattooing is within the context of headhunting. No, it's not. Uh, another one is, let's see here. Uh, I saw another one I wanted to address. Um, I've been told that it's somewhat problematic for people to get cultural tribal markings if you aren't part of a tribe. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what they said. I think they were of Kalinga descent. Um, I think I know who you're talking about and they spread a lot of misinformation. Here is, here's my response to that. One, the, the idea that we all belong to different tribes is a misnomer because we really, our ethno-linguistic groups do not fit within the anthropological definition of a tribe. But, uh, under, for example, you wouldn't ever call the Samoan people a tribe. You would call them Samoans. They belong to the Samoan people. They are not necessarily a tribe. Uh, same thing with the peoples of the Philippines. You, you have uh, hereditary leaders. Uh, you have aspects of what anthropologists call tribalism or tribe, or a tribe, but it doesn't fit the definition strictly. The other thing that most people don't realize is that every ethnic group in the Philippines is its own distinct ethnic group. Tagalog people are a specific ethnic group. Uh, they are in an indigenous people of the Philippines. A lot of people are, they get all upset about capital I indigenous, lower, lowercase i indigenous. Uh, they want to say that only people that are practicing uh, an indigenous lifestyle are indigenous, you would never go up to a Native American who's wearing Levi's and say, hey, you're not indigenous anymore because you're wearing pants. Uh, put your loincloth back on. Put your bahag back on. You know what? Tagalog people, at the, in, at the end of the day, your ancestors wore bahag. Your ancestors worshiped particular gods and deities. You had your own practices, your own rituals. Uh, some definitions of it, indigenous, very uh, country to country. For example, in, uh, in Russia, for example, if you, they say that if you have over 50,000 members of a particular ethno-linguistic group, you are no longer indigenous. And that's just a numbers thing. So the definitions of indigenous vary from place to place. And different, academ different academic institutions are always redefining what is indigenous. And then holding everyone to that, those standards that they create. And I'm not trying to crap on uh, academics too much, but that's, uh, who are you to set the standards? Who are you to say that, that uh, my ancestors are no longer indigenous to the Philippines? I belong to, I belong to, to ethno-linguistic groups from the Philippines that are uh, both under these modern definitions considered indigenous and non-indigenous. But you know what, Ilocano people, for example, are, they've always been there in the Philippines. They have their own gods, they have their own practices, they have their own worship, even though they are by the majority Catholics now, they still have their own practices. And so um, 
that being said, each ethnic group has its own markings or form of markings and their own material culture. And a lot of times these designs permeate the material culture as well. So just because you've been told you don't belong to a tribe, even though you're Tagalog or you might be Kapatangan or Visayan or, uh, or Cebuano, for example, you still belong to that ethno-linguistic group. Cebuano is not the same as Waray, for example, in the Eastern islands of the Visayas. Uh, search for your ancestors. Do your genealogy. Uh, find out your family's stories. Find out your people's stories. There's a wealth of, of uh, and richness of culture there and heritage. I hope that addresses uh, your, your question, Mark. Um, was there another one? Or we, or how much time do we got, Alan? Um, do you, okay, we have one last question. Okay. Uh, how can one become a practitioner to one day give batok to others and maintain the tradition? I get, I get that question a lot too. Um, I, a lot of people look at me as an expert, as an authority. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in my journey to be blessed by some of the most prestigious practitioners in the Pacific. Uh, the Suluape family has been very kind to me. Uh, Sua Suluape uh, Ali Alba'a, also known as Patelo Suluape, he is, has, he took me under his wing in the beginning and, and started me off on this journey. Uh, Sua Kione Nunes has also been a huge blessing to me in, in my journey to become a practitioner. I did not intend to be a practitioner. I wanted to stay on the scholars, scholarly side of things. I wanted to receive marks. I never wanted to give them. Um, my, my students, my apprentices are, I have, a, I have about five active ones right now. Um, it's a lot on my plate. I'm, I'm not taking any new practitioner, uh, new potential apprentices until I uh, graduate a few more. Uh, does it have to come through me? Not necessarily. Um, but if you're going to become a practitioner, you should do your homework. Learning technique is one thing. Learning to tap is one thing. There are lots of tattoo artists that are trying to hand tap. They've, they haven't had the privilege I've had of having masters teach me. But uh, they're, you know, doing, sometimes it's just cringy watching them tap too, because it's like, they'll just put the comb over the skin and pow, 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 like a nail and then pull it out. Ideally, it should work like a sewing machine, just in and gently in and out of the skin. It shouldn't be more painful than the machine. In the right hands, tattooing this method is less painful and is just as efficient as the machine. Um, but you'll see these tattoo artists who want to, again, differentiate themselves from their competitors, uh, exotify themselves even, and they will, they'll try to pick up hand tapping and, and then they just end up turning people's skin into hamburger sometimes. Um, I would say, the best way to learn this is if you have a lineage to it, if, you, if, you're, if your particular ethno-linguistic group has lineage still, if you still have living practitioners, then you should be learning from them. If it's someplace that is extinct, then uh, I'm, I'm happy to mentor people, but I, I'm not taking students right now. Uh, it's very hard the, to not just learn correct uh, tapping techniques, but the bulk of, the, the bulk of what my students learn is the knowledge base that goes along with this. So if you want to practice, my suggestion is learn the culture first. Learn these stories first. Because just like, in the, just like with the story of the chat rug, the chat rug, the chest tattoos for the headhunters in the Cordillera, and those are only specific Cordillerans, uh, I wanna also state that, that has a wealth of information that we just glossed over today. Just because I explained what the chat rug is in generalities doesn't mean that you know everything about it. Um, each one of those motifs in there has its own story, has its own meaning, and the meanings are either uh, symbolic of the Anito and the relationships of the Anito. They're, they're also cosmological references there, mythological references to, the, to these markings. 
it's not just oh this is a this is a this is one I see all the time. Uh, oh, I like dogs. I'm a dog person. Can I get a dog tattoo on me? Um, and they see that in my book, and it's a it's specifically an Ifugao tattoo. If you're not Ifugao, you shouldn't be wearing that. If you're not a headhunter, you shouldn't be wearing a dog tattoo because that dog tattoo is part of a ritual, and in that ritual. That's where they sacrifice and eat dogs. Quick side note, dog used to be a ritual food, not just something you get hungry for. And it goes back to this story of Balitok. It goes back to the Talung ritual of the Ifugao people, where they bind the soul of the fallen warrior to the warrior who has taken his life to be his companion, especially when he is sleeping so that he is protected. So th those two are binded together, just like a man and his faithful companion, a dog. That's what that tattoo of a dog represents. Not, I like dogs. This is a dog tattoo. Just because you can identify, oh, this is a centipede design and it's a warrior design, doesn't mean you have the full cultural context of it. So if you wanna be a practitioner, learn the lore, learn the wisdom of the ancestors, that, that accompany these marks because the tattoo is the, I look at it as the zenith of our, of our cultures in the Pacific. It, is, it embodies all these different aspects of our culture. For example, one more quick example, if you'll indulge me. There are spear designs, little triangle designs. And you find that in Hawaii, you find it in, in Tahiti, you find that in Samoa, you find it in the Philippines. And they're, and they're basically very, very similar designs. Now, if that spear design is pointed up, it means one thing. If it's pointed down, it means another thing. Well, why would you orient it differently on the body? Is it meant to be seen from the wearer's perspective? Oh, it, and from my perspective, it is pointed up, but from the outsider viewer's perspective, it's pointed up, down, for example. It just really depends on how that, the, that tattoo is arranged. Is it for the benefit of the person receiving it, or is it marking them to show something for the community to understand and recognize. Now, if the spear is pointed up in the ancient Philippines, as well as other parts of the Pacific, that meant that you were coming with hostile intent. In our modern way of viewing things, having the spear pointed up as you're walking into the village might say, no, it's, it's at rest, it's up. But it's actually the opposite. If the spear is pointed down, if, the, if a man comes into a village with the spear pointed down, he is there in an aggressive stance or he's mourning. So how, he, how these designs are arranged on the body is reflective on the totality of our cultures. So until you have a very good working understanding of the ancient cultures of the Philippines, don't pick up the tools. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think I've had too much coffee today. I'm talking really fast. <laughs> um, I think we're going to transition now. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you for having me. Okay, sorry. All right, now um, Alvin will uh, set up and take two photos. While he's doing that, we want to invite you to our Polynesian cultural panel happening this Thursday, May 6th at 11 a.m. from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, we have cultural practitioners from Tahiti, Samoa, and Tonga repre representing, represented talking about topics ranging from cultural connection to passing down traditions. We also want to invite you to our last event, the Spring College Lecture Speaker, uh, Dr. David Stavall, who will be talking about the interconnectedness of our struggle happening next May 11, 2021 from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, the Zoom links are available on the Padlet. And Alvin, are you ready for the picture? Thank you. Uh, Kuyalane, always a pleasure to listen to you and just 
to just soak up your knowledge. Everybody who is learning under you is definitely getting loving that free education. <laughs> All right, so this is my favorite part. Well, outside of everything else, we're going to take a picture.